Good afternoon, folks. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I'm Christopher. Thanks very much for this. Uh, we've got a good crew uh, lined up for this afternoon. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. This is John Phelan here from HBAM. Um, this webinar is one of uh, HBAM's regular updates and is part of our contribution to the Business Angel Week here in Europe and Africa and Asia. Uh, today we're partnering with Seraph and two highly experienced U.S. super angels, Han Lord and Christopher Moravlin. Uh, you can see both on your screen there, folks, uh, who between them have a portfolio of over 100 companies, and they are founders themselves and have exited a number of companies. Uh, Christopher is also uh, deeply involved with the ACA in the U.S., who we know well through our own connections with Ivan. Uh, both uh, Ham and Christopher co-founded Seraph. Uh, which is an angel portfolio management tool, and they also specialize in angel education. They've given us an education over the last couple of months, uh, some crazy insights into uh, difficulties we've been seeing and challenges we've, we've had ourselves. So it's, it's great to get this deep domain knowledge and experience. Um, and the, co the, the, the topics we are going to cover today are topics which are, are highly relevant uh, pretty much to the angel network network that we have certainly here in Ireland but probably globally they're, 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 they're topics which uh, come up all the time uh, and ones that we regularly see causing challenges to the to the to the syndicate groups we have here um, in Ireland so folks we have about 45 minutes um, and then we'll have a 10 to 15 minute Q&A at the end and you can ask questions through the chat box down the bottom there Ham and Lord are going to, Ham and Christopher are going to do a, a Q&A style in their own inimitable style, and we're going to leave them to it. So thanks, Ham. Thanks, Christopher. I'll leave it to you. Thanks, John. <coughs> you said we have three hours, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Hey, uh, let's, let's get right into it, uh, Ham. Um, I think one of the first things uh, we were going to talk about is um, the importance of team and investing. And I know that you and I have both observed uh, that in a lot of ways, temperament is more important than resume. What does that mean? What do we look for in, 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 a, in, a, in a founding team? Yeah, but before I answer that question, um, I want to make a comment about uh, uh, sort of some of the things that we're covering today. We're going to cover about four or five five different topics, um, but this first topic, uh, the topic about team, um, is really kind of the most important topic that we look at when we're evaluating companies. And when I think about um, uh, how we at Launchpad, which is the angel group that Christopher and I run um, here in the Boston area, when I think about uh, sort of what some of the most important things are that we look at um, uh, when we're evaluating a company, team is the number one uh, uh, part that we look at, and in particular, the CEO. And the CEO has to have sort of the right uh, set of key attributes, core attributes, for us to really be comfortable moving through with an investment. And sort of first on that list, um, and uh, something that if, if the CEO doesn't have it, we don't move forward with, um, is integrity. Um, and I'm sure many of you have run into individuals uh, who you may have liked, but do you question whether they've got sort of that core, the core value of integrity? And without that, it's, it's impossible to invest uh, in companies. And so that's one of sort of the first things that we look for. Second on the list, and uh, not maybe uh, as obvious uh, uh, in early meetings with an entrepreneur, but something that you really need to take into consideration is something we call tenacity. Uh, the ability as an entrepreneur to fail and then get back up again, brush off your knees, move forward, and not only do that yourself, but also convince the rest of your team when you've had a challenging situation that the world hasn't come to an end, that you can keep the company moving forward. For any of you on this, uh, on this webinar who've been entrepreneurs in the past, you know what I mean. You know how difficult it can be running an early stage company and all the challenges that you face. Um, and sometimes you just think you want to give up. Well, great entrepreneurs have that tenacity, that resilience that allows them to keep from kind of giving up. And Christopher, give us some sort of uh, uh, background on what you've seen uh, on that tenacity and resilience side of things. Well, <clears throat> you know, there are different ways to describe it. I, I think. Um, uh, grace under pressure is a, is a word uh, expression we sometimes use. It's 
Uh, resilience sometimes boils down to just being able to have a perspective and uh, bounce back. Uh, a sense of humor can be helpful. Um, if, if the startup is tackling a problem that's really easy to tackle, it's probably been solved already and there isn't going to be a lot of room in the market. So these problems are kind of meant to be hard, as you sometimes say to your children with their schoolwork, right? It's supposed to be difficult. And so uh, tenacity is about being willing to back up, think about it, come at it again in a different way, come at it again in a different way. Uh, and and not um, not be easily discouraged and not be looking for immediate rewards. Yeah. So, you know, first two things we talked about, integrity and tenacity. Third on our list of kind of key characteristics that we look for in an entrepreneur is IQ and EQ. And, you know, the IQ one is obvious. You want someone who is smart. Um, and my guess is that most, if not a very high percentage of the entrepreneurs that you meet with, um, have strong IQ. Um, it's just the nature of what it takes to get a company started and off the ground. You got to have the brains. The EQ one is a little bit less obvious. Um, and for us, the EQ one really relates to their coachability, their willingness to listen, and their ability to communicate with others on their team, with investors, and with customers. We and I was just going to say, Ham, we, you know, most startups are, by their design, under-resourced because you don't want to commit a ton of resources until it becomes clear that there's something there. And so getting done, things done through others is critical. And, and EQ, really, emotional coefficient intelligence, emotional intelligence is really about understanding how to read people, communicate with people, motivate people to make, you know, get more from less, get things done through other people. And it's a critical success factor in our experience. Yeah. And the other side of that coin is um, the coachability side, the willingness to take advice from others. Um, and maybe some of that advice is conflicting. So you can't take everybody's advice, but you have to be open and willing to listen um, and to act on uh, the advice that is appropriate for your particular company. <clears throat> And then, Ham, what about, um, do they have to have gray hair and be an expert in their market? You know, that's a, um, uh, I guess there are two ways to answer that question. Um, the first way is, um, I think if you're in a market segment where you're doing something that's evolutionary, market already exists, um, you're just trying to advance that market. Having gray hair, having a deep market understanding, having the connections to the potential partners and other people that you need to work with in that industry is important, that really, really deep market understanding. But if you're going and looking to totally disrupt a market, sometimes deep market understanding can get in your way. You think, hey, this can't be done. People have tried this before. It doesn't work, et cetera. You don't take the challenge, you don't come at things in a totally different out of the box way. So it depends on what the company is doing, whether we look at a deep market understanding as something that's critical or a hindrance. But I would say in general, a lot of the companies that we invest in at Launchpad tend to be companies that are sort of making advancements in a market and not creating totally new markets. And I'm guessing you'll probably find something similar in some of the deals that you're looking at in Ireland. And therefore, I think a deep market understanding is one of the key characteristics. Yeah. That we look the final one, Ham, is something that's a little harder to define. And I, you and I talk about it in terms of you know, presence or charisma. What, what, what's the importance of that? What does that mean? Yeah, so the importance of sort of that presence or charisma side of things is it's important for the CEO to be able to walk into a room, and whether that room is filled with employees, investors, or customers, that, that individual is in charge. They are able to run the meeting, they're able to communicate successfully, get their point across, um, to really have that presence or that charisma in a way that customers, employees, investors, will do what is in the best interest of the company. Now, you want to be a little careful. Sometimes charisma can go off the charts a little bit and the person can be disingenuous. Um, and 
employees and other people start to pick up on that. So it's got to be real presence. It can't be disingenuous. Yeah, I sometimes liken it to, you know, I, I don't really know this person, but I can tell they're special. You know, yeah. I, I, I'd like to get to know them a little bit better. You know, when I meet a team like that, there's a, a certain gravitas or gravitational pull that, that uh, I think is a, is a hallmark of a great team. Yeah. Yeah. Pam, if I, do you, do we have a second for me to ask you a couple more questions? Because yeah. if you're just trying to aggregate a lot of smarts, then a 20 person founding team is better than a, a three person founding team, right? Yeah, yeah, not really. Yeah, good question there. So um, Christopher's asking sort of what do we look for in that initial founding team, both from a, a size standpoint, but also from a skill set. So let me talk about size. Um, we do not invest in teams that have one person. Um, if you, as a CEO, can't convince somebody else to join you on this crazy journey of yours, then you're not going to be able to convince us as investors. So we look for founding teams of at least two people, and uh, two, three, or maybe up to four is sort of the sweet spot that we think is the right size for a founding team. If you start to get too large a founding team, uh, it's easy for dysfunction to fall into play. It's also the founder economics, who owns what, starts to get diluted a little bit too much. Uh, but I want to come back to the other point, which is what are we looking for in the founding team? What skills are we looking for? And some of these skills should be with the CEO, but some of them can be with other members of the founding team. So some of the key skills we're looking for are, one, um, that deep market understanding that we were talking about. Two, the ability to sell. And it's really important that somebody be on the team, at least to initially be able to sell the idea of the company to investors, but also sell the idea of the product to the prospective customers. Um, we also look for um, uh, a technical skill in the particular area that the company is, is in. We tend to, at Launchpad, invest in companies that are tech-based, and so we want somebody who has that deep technical knowledge. And then the final area that we look for, which is one that um, we feel is sort of not as commonly looked for in a founding team, but what we have found to be quite important is product management skills. And product management is not an area that's typically taught at university. Um, it's a skill that people sort of learn on the job. Sometimes you're an engineer and you move into product management, et cetera. But we want to see those product management skills as a part of that core early team that we're investing in. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a couple other quick observations. You know, we, 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 this is a truncated version of our discussion, so we're not going to end up talking as much about other factors we look for. But uh, can you give me a perspective on the relative importance of, the team versus the plan. Uh, we sometimes talk about A teams and B plans. Yeah, yeah. What are we talking about there? Yeah, so um, I'm sure many of you've heard the expression, um, I'd rather invest in an A team with a B plan versus a B team with an A plan. The reality is with the startup world, um, the first idea, the first presentation that you hear from an entrepreneur in the early stages of a company, the company's not gonna look at all like that two, one, two, three years from now. And an A team has the, sh the skill set to recognize that when they hit the market and their product's not working, they're not getting product market fit, they understand how to pivot, how to adjust, et cetera. Whereas a B team doesn't typically have that skill set. So it is important to look at that sort of team quality uh, and make sure that you're investing in an A team. Yep, and uh, we'll close out this team section uh, by just observing that uh, um, uh, this is something angels can look for. A, a, a high-functioning team is different than a group of high-functioning individuals. Yeah. So we pay a lot of attention to team dynamics. For example, you'll ask a question uh, to the CTO and then somehow before the answer's all said and done, the CEO has taken over and answered everything. You know, those kinds of dynamics you look for and make sure that you're looking at a high functioning team rather than a group of people who are individually high functioning but not working well together. Um, John or Sarah, are there any sort of pressing questions that have come in? Uh um, if not, we will kind of continue on to the next topic.
I think fire on, guys, to the next uh, the next topic. Uh, okay. In the interest of time, and okay. we have some questions coming in. We might ask them all towards the end. If that's okay. Okay, sounds good. I think. All right, so so Christopher, we've talked about team. Let's talk about market. Um, can you tell me what you think some of the key characteristics of an interesting and investable market opportunity is for a startup company? Yeah, I'll talk about the quality qualitative factors in a moment, Ham. But I think we just need to make sure there's a baseline understanding on the quantitative side of it, right? Um, there are many, many wonderful startups in the world that, that are well worth pursuing that may not be a good fit for the kind of risk equity that we invest, right? I mean, in some ways you could think of us as, as providing uh, rocket fuel rather than ordinary petrol, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, one of the one of the issues what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to put uh, risk capital into a company uh, for a fractional ownership, and that company is going to go off uh, and attempt to get fractional ownership of a market, and they're going to dilute our ownership over time. So if we're uh, if we're in the angel investing is an asset class with tremendous. Nah, percent of failures, 50%, you know, failure rate in your portfolio is not uncommon. So you really need to model, um, uh, 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 be able to model a high multiple return on each investment, at least on, on the honeymoon night, right? And, and so we're really looking to put capital in and get it out at a 10x multiple, right? And if, and if we're only going to own a fraction of the company, we're going to get diluted and they are going to own a fraction of the market it stands to reason that the market has to be pretty big for, for that, all that mathematics to actually work, for the, for, the, for the math to work and for you to be able to get out an acceptable return for the risk and the time and the illiquidity that you put in. And when you, I'm not gonna trouble people with the, with, the, with the arithmetic behind it, but really when you look at it and you make reasonable market share assumptions and you look at typical capitalization paths, it's very, very hard to get risk equity into and back out of a company that isn't targeting a, a market that they can access that's a hundred million or more US dollars. Um, and that's probably not leaving a lot of room for error. 250 yeah. million would be a much more comfortable floor. Yeah, and, and I would argue that uh, even at those low numbers, the amount of capital that the company can take in has to be relatively small. So if you're going after a hundred million dollar market, the company probably can't take in much more than a million or so of investment capital, equity capital. Um, and those smaller markets, those hundred, two hundred million dollar market opportunities are not something that a typical venture capitalist is going to invest in. So you as an angel investor have to make sure that you and anybody else you're syndicating a deal with have that full amount of capital in reserve for that. So you've talked about the the, the quantitative side. Talk about sort of the qualitative side. What's, a, what's an interesting market to you? Well, so um, uh, first of all, it helps if the market exists, right? And is not purely a fiction of my imagination or, or, or speculative. And so, um, uh, you know, there are obviously different kinds of opportunities. What, what a startup is trying to do is it's trying to accrete value faster than it burns equity, right? So that it's, it's, creating, um, it's, it's creating an increasing amount of value over time. And different market conditions uh, will favor that. For example, markets that are growing enormously quickly create a lot of opportunity. A rising tide floats all boats. Markets where um, there have been a tremendous number of small players, very fragmented, and there's an opportunity for a leader to come in. Uh, oftentimes, um, you know, with a, a new technological advance. And that's, that's one of my favorite. You can get a dynamic where everybody who's shoveling coal really could use a better shovel, but steam shovel, but nobody's gonna build one because they couldn't justify the cost if they could only use it themselves, right? So a third party can come in and, and invent a better steam shovel and sell it to everyone in the industry and really consolidate what had been a challenged and fragmented market. So we're, we're looking for sort of uh, nonlinear, discontinuous market opportunities where a startup can bring a new technological solution or a new way of looking at it um, and, and, and rapidly uh, gobble up um, uh, market share as it's redefining its market. Um, the other um, 
The other kinds of market characteristics that we pay attention to uh, have to do with uh, the ability to reach customers, uh, to communicate with them in an efficient way, to bring them on board for a reasonable uh, sales cost, uh, whether there's an ecosystem of potential partners, whether there are potential acquirers, whether the competitive climate is such that uh, the company can protect its margins. Do they have something that allows them to maintain a little bit of pricing power and protect protect their margins over time, because those margins are what's going to help you manage your dilution, right? If a company is able to grow and drop a little bit of cash to the bottom line and, and uh, pull a little bit of unit economics as they, as they go forward, that's going to mean they, they need less equity as they go forward. So we're, we're trying to think a little bit about the market in terms of, uh, is the company going to be able to go forward with, with, with some ease and efficiency or are they going to have to fight like a machete in the jungle every step of the way? Yeah. Because it changes the economic plan for us. So you, you touched just briefly there on competition. Can you dig a little bit deeper? You know, do you really care if there's competition? Wouldn't you like it that there's no competition? No. Uh, if you show me an entrepreneur with no competition, I'll show you an entrepreneur with no market. Yeah. Even if there aren't clear competitors selling exactly the same thing. They're always alternates and substitutes, right? And so um, market readiness really is uh, oftentimes um, uh, comes hand in hand with, with some competitors. And frankly, competitors can be very valuable in educating, uh, making the market more ready, giving the market um, some, uh, some heft and some credibility, uh, educating people on things. And, and most competitors who are more established and larger and have more resources are, uh, come with really significant strategy taxes they have to bear. For example, they have to be backwards compatible with a whole generation of previous customers or they have another agenda. And so as a general matter, a specialist can always outperform a generalist in relation to a specific customer. The question is, can the specialist get enough scale and, and if the generalist is willing to uh, you know, run at a loss for a long period of time, that can make it hard for the specialist. So last thing on the market, and this sort of ties into that competition side of things. Um, we know that most of the exits that we have, um, nice dog you got there, Christopher. <laughs> this is Bella, she's my co-investor right here. Yeah. So, so most of the investments that we make at Launchpad um, uh, are going to go not to an IPO for us to get an exit, but are going to go to an acquisition. So how do you look at sort of the market from an acquisition and exit standpoint? Well, um, we, it's difficult. The, the holding periods are long enough that it's difficult to predict with any accuracy exactly what the constellation is, is, is going to be like when the day comes. Um, but we do think about what kind of value these startup, this startup, this team is creating and who it's going to be of interest to. And then we pay a lot of attention to um, what the company is going to have to look like uh, when it gets bought. So in the United States, in our economy, for example, um, the majority of positive liquidity events are M&A, not IPO. IPO is uh, less than a, a, a percent of, of the companies founded um, and probably in the neighborhood of 3% of the positive exits. Um, so most are by M&A. And when you look at the statistics, clearly if you read TechCrunch, you know, there are occasionally 250, 500 million, uh, billion dollar exits, but they're very rare. They happen once a month, maybe a dozen a year, right? Most M&A exits are gonna be in the 20 to $40 million range, right? Um, and, and so, uh, you, you need to understand uh, where it is you need to get and get there in as capital efficient a way as possible because you can't put $10 million into a company, wait five years and sell it for $20 million and get an even remotely acceptable return. Yeah. All right, so I think we've covered the, uh, the topic of market size. Again, there's a lot more material that, uh, that you and I have, have online related to uh, uh, to that. Um, and uh, I think uh, John and Sarah probably shared a link to our website. 
uh, for the content that we have uh, that we've been talking about today. And it's both in electronic form, and there's also uh, through Amazon there are books that you can uh, that you can purchase related to this. But keeping this moving forward, let's move on to this. Sorry, uh, John. Here, I'll just interrupt for one second. Just we had a question yeah. here, which you guys might be able to to answer, and it's appropriate, I think, for this point in time. Um, so the question from Neil is, is, is how early is right, the right time for you to invest? Pre-revenue or after some monetization? So that's going to really vary a lot by the group and the financial structure you have in place and how risk, what your level of risk tolerance is. In the case of Launchpad, we have two types of people in our group. We have people who will invest as early as two people in a business plan. And I would say that represents about 15 to 20% of our group. But the majority of our group likes to see the company have maybe some initial traction, a little bit of revenue, or at least a handful of customers who are playing around with the product. The main exception to that would be in the life sciences where we're always investing in the early product stage. Yeah, I was just gonna say, John, uh, <clears throat> If there's no traction at all and the product really hasn't been been proven at all, then that's fine. Uh, but the investor is taking on a lot of risk. And unfortunately, the limits of sort of making the founder economics work, um, uh, and making sure that the founders own enough stock that it's going to be worth the slog to get to the end, means that you can't be fully compensated for taking that risk on in terms of just having a lower valuation. At some point, you reach a valuation floor where uh, you just can't go really much more, much more lower and have it, have it still work. So at, at that point, it's a matter of personal taste and preference. Am I comfortable taking on this market adoption risk uh, because I'm an enthusiast of the team or the space or the technology or the market? Uh, you know, am I willing to take that on even though I know I'm probably – if I waited a little while, I could get the same deal terms and, and, and with less risk and more. And, and more maybe, knowledge. Chris, or just to put it in context for people, as a percentage of your own investments, how many would you have that are pre-revenue versus uh, revenue generating? Well, I'm going to interpret that question as being at the time of uh, investment. Correct. And uh, the, 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 the numerical answer is that it's a, it's a pretty small fraction. I'd say that um, the life sciences investments are a special category because they're typically pre-revenue. And not only are we taking market adoption risk, we're taking technology risk, right? Can it even be built? Um, but in, in, in terms of sort of the typical kind of technology investments, I'd say maybe 10% or less we would invest on a completely untested pre-revenue basis. Um, uh, typically when you look at a, a group like Launchpad, which gets a lot of good quality deal flow, we're going to be typically investing, you know, right around at the point of product, you know, market entry. The team has basically been built. The product has basically been built. It's in the hands of a few beta customers that are perhaps paid a few initial sales, but really our money is going into building out sales and building out marketing in an attempt to find a, a repeatable sales model with an appropriate cost of customer acquisition. So, that, so technically it may be well validated, it's robust, uh, but maybe not have the sales engine behind it just yet. Exactly, exactly. Perfect. Okay, thanks guys, I'll let, let you guys move on on that. Thank you for that. So Ham, um, I, was, I wanted to talk about diligence and I was, I was thinking that since these things fail all the time and it's basically a crapshoot, you should probably just go ahead and invest without, without any diligence, right? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what we do at Launchpad. <laughs> no, seriously, um, there is a really wide range that we see in the angel community for the amount of diligence that's done. And, uh, you know, Christopher is sort of half jokingly, you know, who cares about diligence, just write your check. There are people that uh, we co-invest with who take that attitude. You know, they have a quick 15 minute, maybe half an hour meeting with an entrepreneur. They like the entrepreneur and they write a check. On the other end of the spectrum, we know of investors who will take months, six months, seven months, et cetera, doing very in-depth diligence as part of their process before they move forward with an investment. And uh, we have issues with both approaches. Uh, we don't like the just write a check on the spot 
And we also don't like the, uh, the approach of take six months uh, because that really has a negative impact on the company and the company's ability to move forward. So we tend to focus on a slightly different approach at Launchpad. Um, in particular, in our case, we like to pull together enough diligence over about a one month time period where we're focusing on the key issues. You know, when the company comes and presents to you, um, after they present, if you as, a, as an angel group or uh, with the people that you're co-investing with, sit down and say, okay, what are the two or three most important things that we need to dig into here? And let's focus on them. And I would argue that uh, you know, one of the top things, and we brought this up earlier, is team. And so doing a really good job of understanding the team, doing the reference checks that's appropriate, et cetera, is important on the team. Um, it's also important to understand the market opportunity here. So again, that second topic that we talked about, what's the, mark, what's the true market opportunity that this company is going after? And there it's making sure that you've sized it right, but it's also important to talk to prospective customers or current customers and find out how important this product or service is to them in solving their key problems or issues. So we look at those two things as obviously as obvious areas. And then from there, we figure out, okay, what are the most important secondary items that we really need to dig into? <clears throat> Let me, um, let me make a, an observation about philosophy here before we talk about how we reduce our diligence down into a report. You know, it just, uh, I, I think experience has sort of taught me and I, I'm constantly humbled by, by the company evaluation process and realizing there were issues I didn't see. In life, it sort of seems like we're optimists and it's just easier to imagine the obvious ways something might work, especially when you have a charismatic, passionate, person who's quit their job to go pursue it, right? There's a, real, there's a real desire to believe, right? And it's often easier to imagine how it could work than to grasp the sometimes very subtle and complex ways in which something could go wrong, right? And, and there's just no doubt in my experience that a little bit of time spent on due diligence always yields, at a minimum, a more nuanced and balanced view. And if you don't do any diligence at all, you're, you're giving up the chance to discover, you know, to, to think about and consider very easily discovered issues. So with diligence, you don't need to be a perfectionist. A little bit is better than none at all, and a little bit more is better even. You, but you don't have to, there really is a point of diminishing returns. For example, for a company that might not be able to build the product, the fact that the minute books are not in perfect formatting is really a detail. For a company that uh, does not yet have product market fit, uh, it doesn't matter as much, um, you know, where, where, where they're headquartered, right? So uh, diligence is about some is better than none and trying to focus on the major issues because there's low-hanging fruit. There's insights and learning that's just right there for anybody who wants to dig in and take a look. Yeah, and, and I would say in the case of Launchpad, when we're looking at these companies, um, when we go into diligence, we're spending somewhere between 20 and maybe 50 hours in that process spread across multiple people within the group. So we're not talking about a huge daunting task here, but we're also not talking about, uh, you know, uh, just quickly whipping through it and not putting some attention to detail. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Ham, are there a couple of lessons, I can think of a couple if you can, uh, that, that we've sort of learned the hard way on, on, um, on diligence mistakes in the past? Yeah, I, um, I think one of them is, is to be sort of, uh, um, overwhelmed by an entrepreneur's charisma and think, you know, this person, um, uh, you know, they've had lots of great accomplishments in, the, in their past. Uh, uh, they really understand this market. Um, they're the right ones to run this particular company. And the reality is sometimes you will see someone who has that charisma, who has that industry knowledge, but they don't understand what it takes to run an early stage startup company. Yeah. Just because you worked at 
a big successful company in a relatively senior role doesn't mean you have the skill set to be a CEO of a startup company. Yeah. That's a different kind of personality, a different kind of skill set than that classic one. Another mistake that we've made occasionally, it gets back to the question John was asking, was you know about uh, about early attraction. A mistake that we sometimes make is confusing excitement on the part of a small and non-representative group of early adopters with true market pull, right? You know, Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm has pointed out that anybody can get 10% of a market, right? It's the next 30 or 40% of the market that's really, really tough. And so <clears throat> we've learned to really try to dig into customer priorities and understanding the profile of the small handful of people who have interacted with the company. Yeah. And if they're, if they're eager early adopters will buy one of anything, you gotta keep digging. Yeah, and we've actually changed our diligence process and asked a different set of questions to really suss out, is this customer your traditional early adopter who'll buy one of anything, or are they more representative of the market? And that's an important set of questions to ask of the customers and the prospects during the diligence process. So, Ham, um, you're doing all this 50 hours of excellent work. You must write a 100-page report, right? Oh, oh yeah, definitely. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, we don't write 100-page reports. As a matter of fact, uh, we do work with other uh, investors in our community who do write 100-page reports, and guess what? Nobody reads a 100-page report. So uh, at, at Launchpad, one of the things that we really try to focus our teams on, our diligence teams on, are writing short, concise reports. A typical Launchpad diligence report is somewhere between three and five pages long. In a table format, yeah. um, and yeah. it's divided into a structured group of sections. Um, I'd argue you don't really understand something until you can summarize it and yeah. forcing our diligence teams to really boil it down. Our diligence reports, in, in a lot of ways, the most important section is the, the section on what needs to be believed in order to think this is a good investment. Mm -hmm. If you really force someone to articulate the assumptions that they're making, you bring a lot into focus. Okay. So. so um, in the spirit of keeping things moving and getting through as many of our topics as we can, I'd like to sort of transition the diligence discussion to um, the deal process side of things. How do we at Launchpad run our due diligence and that whole deal process? So let me start with a question for you, Christopher. Um, what do you mean that the process um, has goals of sort of efficiency, insight, informed decision making, what are those things, what do they mean to you, and how does that uh, affect our process? There's a lot that goes into a deal process. Um, uh, you know, you want to balance speed against quality. Uh, when, you're, when you're running, we think about running Launchpad as managing a giant human capital volunteer budget of, of time. And so, um, you want to you want to move quickly. You want to be respectful of your investors' time. You want to be respectful of the the entrepreneurs' time, um, and yet you wanna you want to do um, you want to do a thorough job. So uh, at a micro level, uh, coaching people to be thoughtful and organized and ask you know bundle their requests for information at all at one time not dribs and drabs constantly pecking away at the team couching tough questions in respectful ways uh, that are not cynical or sort of uh, designed to be like a gotcha question or coming at an entrepreneur with with cynical skepticism but at a more macro level a lot of the key to, to a good process, Ham, is really trying to run things in parallel. So a typical diligence exercise is going to end up focusing on six to eight out of a normal 10 to 12. There are 10 to 12, universal sort of 10 to 12 issues with every startup, and your diligence is going to focus on a core six to eight and putting small teams of two to three people on each of those core topics, key topics, and having them work in parallel and having a project coordinator who's responsible for quality control and a timeline uh, so that you can get things going in parallel. 
And while they're working, as things begin, we have regular check-in calls. And it's hard to describe this because we've written it. And it's probably the longest book we've written is the diligence book. Um, but uh, having a process where you've got, you've got a bunch of teams fanning out and working in parallel and then sequencing things. So for example, we don't call customers and, and risk upsetting uh, the customers or other investors of a company until we're fairly sure we want to go forward. We don't start negotiating deal terms until we're pretty comfortable we're going to go forward. But once we've reached a tipping point where we're liking what we find, it's important to get those other things going in parallel. So at about the halfway point, we begin to talk about terms with, with uh, an entrepreneur. And typically, we're going to sanity check valuation before we even start because we're not going to even do it if, if we're not in the same planet on valuation. But we start working on that. And as we're starting to get comfort that the, the process is coming together and the deal terms look reasonable, it's at that point that we begin reaching out to trusted syndication partners and starting saying, hey, we've got one that we like a lot. It's starting to come together. We're not done yet, but you might want to get them rolling in your process. And it's that, it's that fast, efficient, diligence process that produces a good industry respected uh, report coupled with good deal terms that are market acceptable deal terms. It's that kind of deal leadership that allows you to pull together powerful syndicates and raise money for companies in a fast and efficient manner. So I have one last question for you and I think we're probably going to have to transition to questions from the audience, but, um, what you've described is a process that we at Launchpad have developed over sort of the last 16 years or so. Um, and it's taken us many iterations to do that. But can you talk to uh, the audience a little bit about sort of the scale of our organization that allows us to put teams like that together? <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> we, um, <clears throat> we've been very fortunate. Uh, it, we're, in a, we're in a region in, in the Northeast in Boston where uh, there's just lots of entrepreneurial activity. Uh, and lots of technology expertise and so forth. So we're actually a network of 150 investors, and all of whom are pretty deeply networked people, which means um, we're, they're bringing us a lot of companies and they have a lot of connections and a lot of experience and knowledge in terms of evaluating companies. And so um, it's, not, uh, it's not impossible for us to put three 15-person diligence teams on the field in parallel at the same time on three different companies. We, it gets a little uncomfortable at more than two, uh, but we've maintained uh, three and even in some cases four diligence projects in parallel. Yeah. That, takes, that takes people and, and it's overseen by yourself and myself and we have two people working for us on the team. Uh, so it is, if you're gonna use a, a capital pooling model, uh, whether it's, it's a network of small uh, angel groups, a syndicate of small angel groups, or whether it's a single large angel group, it does take people power to get these things done. And I would add one more thing to that, that people power are people with different backgrounds. So a typical team will have someone who's looking at the finance side who has CFO type experience. The sales and marketing is going to have some people on that team who have sales and marketing experience, et cetera. So when you're building up a group of angel investors, you do want diversity of both industries that they've been in, job titles that they've held, um, gender, et cetera. You want that diversity on your, in your group so that that can be applied to the teams that you're building to do diligence. Yep. Yep. Um, so probably, probably throw it open, um, and we can talk some more, John, if there aren't questions, but probably we should... Uh, no, we, 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 have, we have questions to, for, for both of you. Thanks, Tom and uh, Christopher. Um, unfortunately, you're too good for me because I, I keep writing questions and then you keep answering them before I've got the chance to get the <laughs> questions, which is great. Um, and just an observation from, from our side, uh, particularly around the due diligence, uh, we've seen both ends of the spectrum. We, we have one story where one of our, our angels invested a million euros in a company uh, that he overheard at dinner in a restaurant. Okay. <laughs> and on the other end of the spectrum, we have a group that invested 
a couple of hundred thousand and it took nine months of tortures TT for everybody involved. So we've seen and seen everything in between. So it's great to get those, uh, your insights into fast, efficient and quality DD. And that's yeah. the first question. We yeah, have. John, I was actually going to just say, you know, it, it, all the diligence in the world doesn't help you if you end up curdling the milk yeah. and you end up at each other's throats. So, you know, there's a notion of sort of locking in the freshness, you know, hit the majors, get the thing done, respect the entrepreneur's time. As the trust bit as well, I would imagine in terms of you're investing in somebody you have to trust. There's going to be unknowns. And it's, it's as you came back to your first point was you're investing in the team. You have to yeah, trust yeah. the team. So I think you have to, at some stage, you let it go if you don't have the full answers and just trust that they are going to do the right thing by you and by the company. Uh, so just very quickly, we had Barry had come in with a, a query, and I think it was to you, Christopher, you mentioned that uh, there were six to eight topics that you would look deeply into uh, when you're doing your DD. Uh, do you have those six to eight there? I think Barry's just up to see exactly what they are. And if they aren't there, they're obviously on your website. But, uh, oh, sure. Yeah. And in fact, um, our report templates on the website, but um, obviously uh, you're, you're, looking, you're looking at a leadership assessment. That's a key a key factor. I, my associate, my investing associate is on the move here. Um, you're, the team's a, a key factor. You're looking at the market characteristics and the competition as a second factor. You're spending time uh, looking at um, the product uh, and, and it's, it's relative, you know, how strong its value prop is and its relative attractiveness compared to what else is on the market. And we pay particular attention to both defensive and offensive IP questions. So are we stepping on any IP toes in pursuing this product? And are we comfortable that we might be able to build a little bit of intellectual property around to help us protect the margins and maybe drive a little bit of extra value when it comes time to exit? We also spend a, a, a lot of time um, looking at the, the, just the basic unit economics, the inherent margins in the business, the, the go-to-market and sales approach. For example, um, if it's a $1,000 product and they suggest they're going to be uh, going to a direct sales approach, uh, we know there's an immediate problem. Uh, however, if it's a $100,000 product, maybe a field, direct field sales force makes sense. So we're trying to match the operational and financial model and sales model to make sure that the value prop and the inherent margins and, and the price points are all going to kind of hang together into a model that is a reasonable first draft. Obviously, no plan survives contact with the enemy, but uh, it's got to hang together at a, a reasonable. And then the, the, the remainder of our diligence is really uh, is focused on the exit climate and who might buy you and why and for what, for what specific types of value, uh, and, then, and then the deal terms, making sure that, um, and, and this is an area where Ham and I have done a tremendous amount of writing, but, but making sure that the angel math makes sense. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Ham, or whether we want to go to the next. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the only thing I would elaborate, there is a lot of material that we have on the web. Uh, um, we have a template um, due diligence report. Uh, we have a, a due diligence checklist that goes through all of the items that you just mentioned, et cetera. And they do vary from company to company. The diligence that you do on a life science company is very different than what you do on a, on a software company. Excellent, folks. Thanks for that. Um, maybe moving on slightly onto a slightly different topic and maybe a bit of a tangent to what we've been discussing here. What we've seen our, ourselves uh, in HBAN is the evolution of, of uh, investing over the last 10 years. We started with individuals, uh, then we moved to syndicates. We started to see syndicates of syndicates investing with each other. So recently, we had three syndicates invest together in one company, of which 36 angels went in, but they were actually from different groups all over the country. And now what we're beginning to see is syndicates in the likes of New York uh, and Singapore co-invest with syndicates in Ireland. Do you guys co-invest much, and would you have any advice on co-investing? Yeah, so... We have been doing uh, co-investing with other angel groups um, since 2005. Uh, as a matter of fact, Launchpad 
was the first group to actually drive a syndicated group investment in the United States. Uh, we did it for a life science company. Um, so we have a lot of experience. I would say in our case, um, not quite 100%, but close to 100% of the deals we do, we're syndicating with at least one other angel group uh, in the Boston area. So very common for us to do it. We like to have additional investors around the table because we know these companies are going to be raising additional rounds of financing. And we want to help control the financing destiny of the company for as long as it's appropriate for us to do that. Many of the companies that we invest in, and Christopher gave the example, most exits are in the 20 to $40 million range. That kind of exit isn't interesting for VCs. It is interesting, though, for angels, assuming that a reasonable amount of capital goes in. And the way we make sure that a reasonable amount of capital goes in is by having a syndicate of investors who are in alignment with our thinking process. Two very, very important caveats, however, John, that I want everybody listening to, to pay attention to. Number one is uh, diminishing, increasing risk with increasing distance. So, uh, and the other is the importance of deal leadership. And uh, those two things are sort of intertwined. Um, if, we've agree, if we've all agreed that team is one of the most important elements and you've never met the team, you better trust the person who's done the diligence. Um, and, and we at Launchpad don't go geographically that far afield because we think that getting to know the team and assess the team is vitally important. We think that being there to help post-investment is vitally important. And, and we think that... Um, uh, deal leadership is so important that we strongly prefer to lead our own deals. So by all means, you know, pool money in a region. But if you find yourself uh, investing in a, a faraway deal uh, with a deal lead or a co-investor you don't know and don't trust or you can't identify the deal lead, then uh, I would suggest you save your money and, and spend it a little closer to home. And I suppose just, just to, to put it all in context, the, the, certainly the New York and the Singapore deals that we would do, the, the, the criteria is that we have a local lead that we know and we've worked with before. We also have the DD documents available and that the majority of the funding is, is, is uh, they have visibility on it. So really it's only coming in on the back end to put a bit of extra gas in the tank on the cash side, but more importantly, the companies have to be uh, trying to access the US market for the New York Angels. Yeah. And really what they're doing is introducing the companies into their own network on the East Coast yeah. and helping them accelerate sales. And just be, just be a little bit aware, you know, I, I, I think that's a great model and we're seeing it work very well and it's, it's definitely becoming a very mainstream approach, but um, just be aware of a, a Greek bearing Greek gifts, right? I mean, <laughs> the rounds that uh, the rounds that get syndicated most broadly are often the rounds that are the hardest to fill, uh, perhaps because it's early in the company's development, or perhaps because the round is a little bit large relative to stage, or perhaps perhaps because there's adverse selection going on and it's not that attractive. So. Um, Good point. Knowing knowing your co-investor and trusting them and having something that amounts to a reciprocal agreement that I'll bring you into my best stuff if you'll bring me into your best stuff is the kind of arrangement you're looking for, sort of a preferred syndication partners kind of an approach. Excellent. Maybe one last question, folks. Um, and you mentioned it a number of times there, is the exit strategy. And how early do you start putting in place an exit strategy? I know you have it on your DD documents there. When do you start executing on that? Yeah. So the, the exit side of things is a conversation we have very early on. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the slides that we ask entrepreneurs to do when they're presenting in front of Launchpad in the beginning is who are the potential acquirers of this business. Uh, but once the investment's made, um, and let's say we have a board seat, one of the responsibilities of the board member is at least once a year at a board meeting to have as a core discussion item uh, 
what's going on from an exit perspective. Now, a very early stage company, chances are they're not going to have an exit for at least five years, if not seven or 10 years. But an exit doesn't happen overnight. It's very rare that a company comes in from the outside and just wants to acquire the business. More typically, the company that you've invested in has to put real effort into place into teeing up an exit. That includes talking to the prospective uh, acquirers, primarily from a partnership basis, not saying, hey, I'm interested in selling my company, but starting to build a relationship with those particular companies. And that type of relationship building can take years. But you as an investor, in particular the board member, needs to be encouraging the CEO to have that as part of what they're doing on a semi-regular basis. So we put a lot of emphasis on the exit side of things. One of the things that we've learned both here in, in the Boston area but at a national level is that getting these early stage companies to an exit is not easy and it takes real concerted effort from management and the board to ensure that happens. Here's a very concrete suggestion. This is a, in very concrete terms, this is what we do. As soon as we invest in a company and we, we appoint a director, you know, we help them get organized for the first board meeting, but we actually do an onboarding of a, each portfolio company to bring them into uh, our portfolio and help them understand our calendar and all the different ways we can help. And one of the first things we do is book them for a sit down breakfast with uh, an investment bank that we've been working with for a number of years who can help them understand what exit readiness looks like and all the things that have to happen over a course of a number of years to achieve exit readiness. And then we get our directors who sit on portfolio company boards for us, about 40 boards at current count. We get them together quarterly and we have some variation on, are you making any progress on exit readiness as a regular standing part of the agenda of those meetings? Perfect folks, we've got two minutes left. I have one question that's come in from Brian, uh, which is what percentage of invested companies do you need or expect to deliver? Ham, you go ahead and do the do the uh, ten I, company math. Um, uh, so, if I understand the correct cor question correctly, um, what kinds of returns do we get out of a portfolio? And Christopher's suggestion is okay. So, in a typical ten company portfolio, what should your expectations be? Um, so, if we look at Launchpad's portfolio, groups invested in over a hundred companies over the last uh, uh, number of years, and of the ones that have exited. Half have failed. Uh, they've returned zero, maybe maybe a little bit above zero, but they've returned less capital we've invested. The remaining companies split up into what I would say are two or three categories. Uh, the first category being, you know, they return all the capital you've invested and a little bit above that, maybe a two x or a three x. Then there's a second category of companies that are returning sort of in the in the four to maybe eight X. And then uh, there's a final category that are the 10 X or greater. Typically what you see is out of 10 companies, <clears throat> three or four are in that one and a half to eight X range. And one, if you're lucky, is in that 10 X plus range. And that one that's in the 10 X essentially returns most, if not all of the capital you invested across all the other 10 companies. And those remaining companies that return in sort of the one and a half to eight X, um, those are the ones that make the difference as to whether this fund is a two X, four X type return level. At Launchpad, what we've seen to date is that we're returning um, capital at a level that um, we would expect our overall portfolio to be at the minimum of a 2x return and probably more like a 3.5x return. As a VC with a 10-year fund, you're in the top quartile if you're returning 3x on the fund. Uh, that's a top venture capital investor. As an angel investor, you have different parameters than a VC does. Your timing can be quite different. Um, you can expect different types of returns, but what we've seen from the studies that have been done is that a well-managed, and I use the term well-managed, angel portfolio 
should be returning in the mid to high 20% on an annual basis. But it takes quite a few years before you start seeing those returns happen. Don't expect much in the way of returns in the first five to seven years of your investing. It's really going to be years 10 and beyond where you're going to start to see the bigger exits. I know in my personal case, um, my first 10x plus return took uh, seven or eight years, and then a 20x return was, it, it was like 13 years before that 20xer came. Excellent, folks. Thanks for that, Ham. Thanks, Christopher. I think we're going to close it off there. We're just on time. Thank you. Well done. Um, for, the, for everybody who's listening, just want to say big thanks to Christopher and to Ham. Thanks to yourselves for joining us. Uh, the, the guys do have more resources available on their website, at the Seraph website, and, and Sarah would have shared the link earlier. Uh, we'll also have uh, some of them available on the HBAN website. We look forward to hearing from Ham and Christopher again in the future. It's great to have these little webinars, and it's great to get the insights, and thank you very much, guys. Um, this webinar has been recorded, so it will be available on both the Seraph website and on the HBAN website, and Sarah will send that link around. And I think that's us. That's it from us, guys. Thank you very much, Christopher. Thanks, Ham. We'll talk to you all soon. Thank you, John. Thanks, Sarah.